Amen. And so, do you, have you all opened up your Bibles to Isaiah 26? All right, so let's stand to our feet, and we're going to just honor the reading of the Word of the Lord, if you can. Um, and I'm reading from the New International Version. It says, verse 1, In that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. God makes salvation its walls and ramparts. Open the gates that the righteous nation may enter, the nation that keeps faith. You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord, the Lord himself, is the rock eternal. Verse 3 in the King James Version reads, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Quiet on your hearts before the Lord. We're just going to pray for a few moments. Father, we honor you. Lord, this is the time that we break the bread of life from your word. We honor you. We yield ourselves completely to you. Have your way. Transform us today. Change us, Lord God. We are here for you. I pray as the vessel today bringing the word, Lord God, that you will be magnified and glorified through this vessel so that people will see Jesus as I speak. We love you. We expect great things. We honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Clap your hands just one more time. Now remember I told you to say something to someone earlier on and you told them you were excited? Turn to somebody else and say, it's going to be great in here today. And you may take your seats. Praise God. I know I'm a a couple of days late, but happy Canada Day to everyone. You know, we are blessed to live in a country that enjoys one of the highest standards of living in the world. The annual ranking of the world's most livable cities has been released by the Economist Intelligence Unit, and uh, 2022's Global Livability Index, and Canada was the biggest winner, with three of its cities nabbing a spot in the top 10. And our cities that made the cut there are Calgary, Toronto, and Vancouver. Now, we're grateful to God for this privilege, and as saints in our church, we want to be net positive contributors to this, not takers. We want to be givers. Now, I thought it also interesting to note some statistics about depressions from the World Health Organization. And if you want to look this up, you'll find it on the World Population Review website. Rates of depression in Canada are 4.7%. 4.7% in Canada, compared to 3.6% in Sudan. Rates of depression are 3.3% in the Philippines and 3% in Papua New Guinea. And so anecdotally at least, the most livable cities don't necessarily have the most contented populations. Today I want to talk about how our quality of life is affected by the way that we think. Now, why, why is that important? Well, for one thing, we can control the way we think. And so indirectly then, we can determine our inner contentment and therefore we can affect our quality of life. And that's a very topical subject in culture today. In fact, statistics from various sources, including if you check out CAMH website, you see that they suggest that more than one in five Canadians, one in five, 20%, experience mental health challenges every year. 
And so there's definitely a need, and happily, Scripture has solutions. But before going there, I think it's useful to locate this conversation with a definition of mental health, because there's many definitions of mental health. Now, Brother Bart, how many of you know Brother Bart? Uh, Brother Bart, can you jump up where you are and shout hallelujah? Hallelujah! <laughs> Thank you, Brother Bart. Brother Bart works in this space, and um, he did a presentation for some of our youth a few weeks ago, and for continuity, I got his permission to share the definition that he used there. And so this is what he said. Broadly speaking, mental health refers to the psychological and emotional well-being of a person at a particular place and time in their life. The quality of our mental and physical health can deteriorate, which sometimes results in illness. Some important things to consider when talking about mental health include a person's personal experience and their ability to negotiate their way in society, end quote. Now, navigating life's journey can be precarious. In fact, the Bible says in Proverbs 14, 12 that there is a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. But Psalm 119, in verse 105, it says, Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. God will keep your mind. Trust God. Stay focused on him, and he'll give you peace. And so I'd like us to unpack verse 3 of the scripture that we read as one scriptural solution to the mental health needs in our society. And it all begins with trusting God. It all begins with trusting God. The interlinear Bible uses the following words to define this word, trust. Words like confident, bold, secure, Feel safe. Be careless. Is that how you feel about God? Are you safe in Him? Are you secure in Him? Can you cast your cares upon Him with total abandonment? Fully confident that He's going to hold you? Can you turn your back and know that you are protected? Here's what the Bible says about the dependability of God's direction. Psalm 19, beginning at verse 7, it says, The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. David trusted God. He was sold out to God's direction above the wisdom of the surrounding kings or the opinions of his own subjects. And in a world of competing claims to truth, we need to have a made-up mind. Now, I want you to consider these verses. Psalm 20 and verse 7 says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. <laughs> Proverbs 3, 5, Trust in and rely confidently on the Lord 
with all your heart and do not rely on your own insight and understanding. Now this is possibly the toughest idea to come to terms with. The fact that God knows more about you than you do. And God wants more for you than you do. Tough but true. You know, it's always fascinated and it's challenged me how difficult it was for Jesus to gain full credibility with his disciples. So just before Jesus was taken captive, he told Peter that Satan desired to sift them like wheat. And so very simply, Satan wanted to test them the way that he did Job, to prove whether or not they really trusted God. And it's a great illustration of what's really happening here. Weed out the fluff in your heart and see what stands. Take away the job, remove the money, let your health deteriorate, you'll see your friends walk away from you, and then you will be exposed to yourself. I ask you, what is left standing? In the end, who or what do you really trust? Peter says to Jesus, I'm ready to go with you to prison and death. But Jesus knew Peter. He knew them all and he said, Peter, when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. And that's why conversion and discipleship are so important. If you're going to come to Jesus to address your mental health challenges, you must first believe that he exists. This doesn't just mean believing that he's alive somewhere. It also means believing that there is an ultimate creator and sustainer of all creation, and that is Jesus. But if you believe that, then there's a bigger picture to grasp. Everyone is born on a path to eternal separation from God because we have all sinned and fall short of his glory. Ultimately, my brothers and sisters, we cannot save ourselves. And that's why God himself came in human form as Jesus, and he paid for our salvation with his own human life. And so it's on us then to turn away from our sins and be baptized, and he promises that we will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We must believe that he is who he says he is. Praise break right there. We got to believe that. But beyond this conversion, we must also believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now that speaks to the importance of discipleship. God looks at the heart. He will reward your discipline in going after him. Peter was doing life with Jesus, but it would take conversion, full trust and commitment before he had a convincing anchor for his brethren. You see, it's possible to follow Jesus while subconsciously your anchor is in the world systems, which we easily gravitate towards because we can see it, we can touch it, and we can feel it, instead of Jesus, who is the invisible God. But if we trust God, we keep our minds anchored on Him. The interlinear Bible uses the following words to define mind. Words like a form, framing, purpose, imagination, Device. We're talking about the thing that holds you up, notably in times of adversity. When things outside you shock you, how does that affect your inner stability? So your crush at school crushes your advances. 
or your application is rejected, does that make you question your value as a person? Your business fails. Does that take away your courage to stand up again and know that you still have a future? It isn't so much the external things that immobilize you as much as your inner frame, your mind. But here's what the Bible says. Proverbs 23, 6 says, and I'm reading this in the King James Version, Eat thou not the bread of him that hath an evil eye, neither desire thou his tainty meats. For as he thinketh in his heart, so he is. The way you think is who you are. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. The morsel which thou dost hast eaten shalt thou vomit up and lose thy sweet words. Brothers and sisters, what's going on inside you has way more impact than what's going on outside you. And so, and so here's, here's how Jesus highlights it in Matthew 23. And this was pretty tough. He paid for this with his life, so this was pretty significant. Listen to this. Verse 25. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, he says, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. But that wasn't enough. Verse 27, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. As a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. Not as a man dresseth with a three-piece suit, so he is. That doesn't cut it. As a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. That goes for women too. But now you're going to say, you're going to say, I know it's about the inner person, Pastor. That's why it's called mental health. But how do I anchor my mind on God? Well, let me illustrate it with the scripture that I read earlier. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my paths. Anchor your mind on what God says in his word. That's, that's how you do it. Imagine walking down a dark alleyway and you're holding a lamp. You can only see the next few steps, but the lamp allows you to see where you're walking right then and you avoid tripping over obstacles. It allows you to avoid them. Now I want you to imagine that your flight is descending to an airport in the night and the plane's headlights give direction to the travel path but so do the lights on the buildings and the runway, so that you head to where you purpose to go. Now that's how knowing what the Word of God says and means guides both your present and your future. God's Word stabilizes both where you are and where you are going. And that's why you have to be selective about what you put into your mind, because that is what forms you. In this sense, we are influenced by our environment. So I put God's promises and principles into my mind. I learn what he says I shouldn't put my mind on, and I make sure that I keep those things out. There's an author by the name of Jim Collins, and he talks about something called the Stockdale Paradox. And he encourages us to face the brutal facts of our situation, but not to dwell there. And so I'm not talking about denial here. But you can be going through hell 
while feeling that you are in heaven. And those of you who were here last week, that's the testimony you heard from the Joachims as they talked about their captivity time in Haiti. I, I think it's time, where, where are they? Brother Bellany, jump again one more time just so we can rejoice. Look at them, jump up, jump up. Three weeks ago, they were in captivity in Haiti for taking their life savings to serve that nation. They were in captivity, not knowing whether they'd be here three weeks later. And what were they doing? They were preaching to those folks, having sermons. Come on. Awesome. Awesome. David put it this way in Psalm 23. He said, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. And so we trust God and we keep our minds anchored on him. Because when God is our focus, he will keep us in perfect peace. The interlinear Bible, I'm liking the interlinear Bible today. They, uh, they, they have these words to define perfect peace. Perfect means complete or whole. Peace is shalom, completeness, soundness, welfare. Peace with God covenantally and with human relationships. Contentment. Look at the length and the breadth and the height of what God promises us here. This is total freedom. It's what I pray that every Christian would experience. Truth be told, though, it also gives me job security with God because people are at different points in their discipleship journeys. But, you know, to be quite open, based on my experience, I really wish there were more Christians who were enjoying this perfect peace that God promises. It's really a question of where we place our focus, is what it is. Listen to Paul's counsel, Romans chapter 14, verse 13. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. I am convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person it is unclean. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not, by your eating, destroy someone for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what you know is good be spoken of as evil. Here, here it comes now. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. Michael Jackson wrote a song, one of many that were famous. This particular one says, I'm looking at the man in the mirror, and I'm asking him to change his ways. Now, some of you may not take Michael Jackson seriously, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use Paul. And Paul says, for now, we see only a reflection as in a mirror but then we shall see face to face. My question to you is this. Even through the mirror, what do you see right now? I'm going to tell you what God wants you and others to see. Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit. When you look in the mirror, He wants you to see love. He wants you to see joy. He wants you to see peace forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. God wants you to see gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law. When we have God's perfect 
peace inside us, it shows up outside. And so it's no wonder that the sage would write in the book of Proverbs 4.23, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. King James Version says, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flow the issues of life. Negative reinforcement is several times as powerful as positive reinforcement. There was a May 2008 article in the National Library of Medicine, and it said that not all emotions are created equal. There is this thing that's called negativity bias in social and emotional development. It's just the way it is. You know, if 10 people tell me after the service that this message was really helpful to them, I will be grateful to God, and I won't think very much about it. Tonight, if someone then texts me a criticism of the message, it's going to take me a conscious effort for me to not let my whole mind be overtaken by thoughts of failure, inadequacy, or defensiveness. Never mind the 10 positive reinforcements that were given before that. My point, which I hope translates to your point, is not about what you say to me. That's not what I'm talking about. I cannot control that. It's about the place I give to what's said, whether it's good or it's bad. That I can control. I am the God of my heart. I am the God of my heart. And so that's why you never find me frequenting a pub, but you find me at prayer. It's why you find me in church and you really find me cheering games. It's why you find me in the word and hardly find me wasting time. Do you want inner peace? Do you want inner peace? You want inner peace? Get to know Jesus personally and keep that relationship growing. Okay, I'm going to step it down to tell you what I mean. You need to know who you are. And you need to be content with who you are. Are we good so far? All right, then you need to know what you are and what you want to be. And then pursue what you want to be but doing it in the context of who you are, in the context of who God made you. Trust God. Stay focused on Him, and He will give you peace. Let's draw to a conclusion here. So I'm not going to be dogmatic about my position that anchoring your thinking in Jesus and his word is the only solution to mental health challenges in the world. I'm not going to dwell there because you'd only need to Google it and you'd find all sorts of other solutions that are proposed. But I am going to be dogmatic about this. Being settled about eternity helps your journey in this life. And being at peace with your eternal future will impact your peace in this life. And so if you are a believer then, you ought to start with what God's word says about mental health. I'm going to repeat it, Isaiah, 6, 20, Isaiah 26, 3. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. That's what is true. Now, we at the church, we offer tools such as the Freedom Session Seminar. There's qualified counseling by Sister Malva and, and others and biblically-based biblically um, discipleship programs. So just to name a few of the things that we have going on at the church that you can tap into. What I'm saying is get serious about these tools and engage with them. 
Now, for clarity, I am not excluding some of the community-based resources. There are some great resources out there. But I am just encouraging you, as a believer, to draw on what you already have first. It is your heritage, and it works. Great place to clap your hands. So if you know Jesus, tap into what he's given you. But if you don't know Jesus, then I'd offer that you should seriously consider his total package. You see, hell is real. And eternity apart from God is a real option too. And only by accepting Jesus, by repenting of your sins and being baptized, can you be saved. But I'm telling you, he'll empower you by the gift of his Holy Spirit so that you live a life of perfect peace as you increasingly surrender your life to him. I'm, I'm not trying to suggest here that there won't be challenges, because there will be challenges for sure. For one thing, everyone's got to die sometime, and that's never going to be easy. But what I am suggesting is that you can access God's grace to overcome the challenges and enjoy inner peace. It's God's gift to us. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord, the Lord himself, is the rock eternal. Amen. Stand to your feet. We're going to, we're going to pray, and then we're going to, we're going to partake of communion uh, immediately after that. Praise God. But we're going to pray. Amen. Folks, um, the thing about preaching over a period of time, you preach long enough and you say the same thing again. And sometimes people think, is that for real? It is. This message is real to me right now. I mean, when you come in to preach at Faith Sanctuary, this is a big platform. You want to come here and you want to have, I mean, you want to be all gung-ho and ready, your mind focused. Waking up to a text that says that my cousin, my close cousin, all of a sudden died the last few hours. That's not fun. Now, don't feel sorry for me. I have perfect peace. But what I'm trying to say is that for me, this is real. This is real. I'm so thankful I am anchored in Jesus and I trust his word. Were it not for that, I don't think I could have stood here this morning and speak the truth of God to you. So don't feel sorry for me. You'll be really wasting your emotion if you feel sorry for me. I'm fine. But what I want to get across is there are folks in here, you're not fine. You're not fine. And you're looking for solutions for the harsh realities in your mind. And you're, you're scrambling because you're looking in many different places. I simply want to suggest to you is start with what you have. You have Jesus. Let's start there. Start there. Trust him. Trust him that he actually can solve your issue because he can. Do you believe that? Amen. Okay, as we believe that together, let's pray right now. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word that's true. We thank you for your grace and mercy. Mm. Bless your people, we pray. Father, touch us mentally and emotionally. There are many things we could ask for today, but Lord, your promise is that you would keep us in perfect peace when our mind is stayed on you because we trust in you. Lord, we trust you. We anchor our mind even in this word today. We're claiming the perfect peace, Lord. Father, show yourself strong in the name of Jesus in the life of the Eurus right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.